I want to welcome everyone to the Jewelry Library. It is good to be back. And I'm super excited about our talk today with Laura Matthews on the case of the missing pendant. I met Laura at one of our live events a few years ago, and I introduced myself and she said, and I and she said, I'm Laura Matthews and I'm a jewelry detective. And I was like, what? And she handed me a card and I swear I thought I was gonna, it was going to say Scotland Yard or Interpol or something because I didn't know that people actually went around saying that they were jewelry detectives. But the card had her name on it and on the back it said simply Gustav Mons. He was my great grandfather, she told me, and he was a jeweler. I had not heard of him, but of course I was intrigued. Now, a lot of us here, a lot of people in the audience consider themselves, I know I consider myself a jewelry detective, fanatical researchers endlessly tracking down information about a piece or a designer or a period in jewelry history. We research jewelry as writers and historians, collectors or dealers, but it's rare when you are researching your family at the same time. And as I've learned from Laura, it's a different kind of obsession. Now, as a result, I've learned a great deal about research from talking about Mons with Laura. And I've come to understand why jewelry detective work in particular is so exciting and rewarding because jewelry survives. It can be found in museums, in auction catalogs, in galleries, in brochures, pictured in magazines. It's on 47th Street. But more importantly, it's in our jewelry boxes and the jewelry boxes of our grandparents and our aunts and uncles and distant cousins. And while we all don't have a Cartier family connection or a Mons one, our jewelry has the power to tell our family stories as well. Now, before we get started, I wanna tell you a little bit about Laura in the years before she became a jewelry detective. Laura was an editor at Condé Nast, Martha Stewart Living and Hearst. She's currently a resident of Manhattan and Westerly, Rhode Island, and she's on the board of the James Merrill House um, Museum in Stonington, Connecticut. If you have questions during Laura's talk, please put them in the chat or the Q&A, and we'll try to get, them, get to them at the end. And now, Laura, the case of the missing pendant. Thank you, Karen. Um, I wanted to... Uh, a call from a graduate student um, who was researching her thesis um, in a school essay written by uh, in the 1940s in a dog-eared scrapbook were kind of the beginnings of our um, search and journey. Um, and it really begins with um, my mom, uh, Dee Dee, who inherited her grandfather's jewelry scrapbook, along with some of the pieces that you're going to see in uh, uh, this presentation. She was a wonderful artist um, who died quite young um, while my siblings and I were still in college. Um, and uh, But she kind of left her mark on us and uh, her artistry and her, um, and her family history. Anyway, fast forward to 2008. Um, and I'm working at my desk in the Hearst Tower and uh, uh, editing helpful hints for Heloise. And I, my phone rings and it's a student from Parsons, who a grad student from Parsons who is contacting me about um, Gustav Mons. She's written her thesis about him and she's looking for images and jewelry photographs that she can include in the uh, um, in the final thesis. So we uh, get together and show her some of, uh, my sister and I uh, get together and bring out some of the jewelry that um, uh, was in the family and also uh, um, a scrapbook of jewelry designs that Gustav had um, collected during a very long career. He arrived in uh, New York City in 1892, and he was in the jewelry business until the 40s. So there were some um, page, uh, pages and pages and pages of 
uh, jewelry designs that he had done. Um, when Court, we invited Courtney uh, to come have a look at this, this archive and um, she was uh, struck immediately by an image by a drawing on the left and she said that she had seen it. She had seen the actual, a, a photograph of the actual piece at Winter Tour, which surprised us. We, we had really no idea what was, uh, that, that there was an archive of Gustav's uh, business records and business books at Winter Tour Museum in Delaware. Um, and she was the first person to kind of inform us about that. Um, and we kind of, my sister and I looked at each other and thought, you know, this, <laughs> she knows more about our family than we do. Um, so that, that's how the, the, uh, our search began. Um, these are the mounting books that a relative uh, of Gustav's had, I think, well, it had, had donated in the 70s. And Winter Tour Museum is mostly a decorative arts museum and doesn't really have a focus on jewelry, but they had these books and some other um, uh, documents related to, to Gustav. And we decided we needed to go down there and go through them and see what they contained. And it was just such a revelation to see uh, all the names of various jewelers who he had um, been making jewelry for. Uh, foremost, some of them. well, some of them. Um, you know, all the, all the um, usual suspects, Tiffany and company by far had the most listings, Cartier, Black Star and Frost, uh, Bailey, Banks and Biddle, um, Gorham uh, and Dresser and Marcus and company and uh, a ton of, of firms that are, were, were very active in the late 1890s and early 20th century, but were no longer um, active. So it was just, it was very intriguing to go through these books. And we started to um, see if we could match some of the jewelry that our mother had, um, some of the mom's pieces, uh, and see if we could find them out in the world. This is a, a, an interest, a curious item. It's a, it's a, a seal fob, and uh, it, it was in our mother's collection, and my sister started to Google to see if she could find one, and she did, in fact, find a matching fob and the only difference was this one had been inscribed by the uh, uh, by Paul Gillot who was uh, it turned out was one of Mons's jewelry clients and it had been inscribed to a, a friend of, of Gillot's but it was just exciting to realize that these pieces might be found out in the world. Um, as we got more pulled in pulled into the uh, to the search of, for, for Mons, we also started to meet um, people who were already in the jewelry history business, I guess, or jewelry uh, studies. And um, we met a, a woman called Elise Carlin who uh, ran uh, conferences every year. And she invited us to, um, to come to a, a a show that she had mounted and asked if we had any Gustav Mons pieces that we'd like to exhibit. And so we gave uh, this elephant um, you see uh, on, on the bottom uh, was one of Mons's pieces and one, maybe, maybe my favorite piece of his. Um, it's a clip brooch that you can wear on your collar um, with jade in it. And it was just beautifully executed and it was thrilling to see uh, Gustav's name and, and to see that he was uh, on, on display. This is a, a piece that was also um, photographed uh, in a photograph at Winter Tour, but we had never seen it um, before. And it's a mermaid purse with water lilies and they're reaching up and uh, the clasp on top is a is a green uh, 
uh, I've forgotten the, the name of the Chris gem. Chrysoprase, maybe. Chrysoprase, thank you, Chrysoprase. Um, so it was fun to see something that he had actually made. Um, and it, it, it's a pretty, uh, a pretty extraordinary piece, really. It's, uh, and there it is in its photograph at Winter Tour. So we began to, um, you know, to hunt for more of Mons's work, and uh, we realized that he had a, a long relationship with uh, uh, a jeweler called F. Walter Lawrence, who was very active in arts and crafts uh, 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 shows. And so I started to, while Kyler was looking for jewelry that might match some of the uh, pieces that we had in, in the scrapbook, I started um, diving into articles about arts and crafts and trying to try to find Gustav in the archives. Um, one of the first things that we saw was uh, this article in Town and Country, which was actually a, a, a Hearst magazine. And we saw some of the pieces that he had made for exhibitions um, at the St. Louis uh, uh, World's Fair in 1904. And it, um, I decided to try to get a look at the um, entry forms and see if I could find any, any uh, information about it. So that's the ent entry form on the left. And it um, was for uh, a Cyprian glass fragment gold pyramid and camels uh, brooch, which is uh, the piece that's at the bottom of, on the right. Um, and it selling price was $300. So um, it was fairly high end valuable jewelry um, in, that, in that time. Um, and we started to try to hunt for these things. These are some more uh, pieces that uh, were exhibited at St. Louis. Uh, the the piece on the on the right is a is a hair comb, and the piece on the bottom left is a brooch, as are the the uh, Egyptian looking ones. They're fairly hefty pieces, um, but this is this was very fashionable at that time, and people were quite fascinated with uh, uh, Egypt and going on grand tours. So uh, it fit in with the, the moment, that moment. What, what is this piece, um, the uh, Department of Applied Arts? What is that? From the a Department of Applied, this was, I'm sorry, this is the catalog listing for, um, for the St. Louis Fair. And it, it uh, lists, I think there are 28 pieces that Gustav made for the for Lawrence's uh, jewelry case. And each one of them has a description. And uh, I didn't put, bring up all the sales records, but there are sales records for each of them. So, and, and in each one, uh, it, it tells you what the materials are and it tells you what uh, the purchase price would be because people did buy these things at the, at the fair. Sometimes they bought them before they were exhibited too. So I, I started to get familiar with um, doing, I had really never done any kind of historical research before I was an English major. And uh, it, you know, I didn't, didn't uh, do that kind of thing in, in school. And I found myself really pulled toward trying to solve these mysteries. And this is a, a, a comb that is at the Cleveland Museum. And uh, my sister and I were uh, invited to give a, uh, to also um, participate in a jewelry show out in Akron at a museum there called Finer Things. Um, and while we were there, we thought, let's, let's drive up to Cleveland and actually see the first piece by Gustav that was, um, you know, in one of these exhibition pieces and it had been acquired by the Cleveland Museum. Um, we don't know who it was made for. Uh, it was actually uh, uh, 
made in, in New York by Gustav, but that it ed ended up in uh, London and Cleveland uh, brought it back. Cleveland, their, their, uh, Cleveland uh, I guess it was a, a, a society that brought, brought it back. So it was thrilling. It was the first time we saw any, anything in a museum that was his. So, all right, so now that we've seen a lot of your kind of entry into the detective work, mm -hmm. um, tell us about Mons, tell us a little bit about. Um, this is a photograph of Gustav in, in uh, Leonia, which is, uh, an, was an artist colony in um, New Jersey in the early 1900s. His, he's with his uh, wife, Martha, uh, who was the daughter of, uh, jewelers from Fort Syme who came, emigrated around the same time Gustav did. Um, and those are his two daughters. My grandmother is on the left and her sister who became one of Gustav's um, saleswomen uh, is Doris is sitting next to him and he's holding a cat and they have a St. Bernard. He was a very, um, he was an animalier sculptor and he loved animals and brought them home. Uh, there's actually a story about him bringing home a, a, a lion cub or a, a, uh, from the zoo, borrowing it so that he could sketch it. Mm. Um, Martha, by the way, is wearing an onyx. Onyx was very, a very popular uh, uh, bead. Um, and so she's wearing her mother's onyx necklace. Um, she, be, she went on to become a, a newspaper publisher in, in town. The marriage unfortunately didn't last. She was half his age and it was an, kind of an arranged marriage between uh, Martha's parents who were colleagues of Gustav. So um, they did separate uh, and he came back to New York City uh, and continued to, you know, to prosper as a jeweler. Um, this is a, uh, this was in our mother's uh, papers. It's uh, a part of an essay that she wrote. Um, she, uh, some, some of you who have kids who are uh, 10 or 11 know this assignment in school where you write about somebody in your family. And so she had interviewed uh, Gustav about his accomplishments and wrote this essay and it got passed around in the family. Um, and it listed among his, uh, his uh, greatest achievements, a bracelet for Sarah Bernhardt and uh, a uh, uh, crown for Car Caruso, Enrico Caruso, who was very, very popular um, when, when Gustav was active. Um, and there were other pieces that she listed there. And um, so it gave us a little bit of a, a sense of what might be out there um, for us to, to search for, hunt for. This is Gustav's brother, Ludwig. Ludwig um, came to the States just about the same time as his brother and he was a horticulturalist and he spent most of his um, career at, at the New York Botanical uh, Society as, as the head gardener. And these are his daughters and son and wife. And uh, Gustav was very close to, to Ludwig and uh, Ludwig's family have some pieces by Gustav, including this uh, jade and gold uh, floral ring. Another floral piece, which I love um, and is it's sitting, I don't know if you can see it, but it's sitting on a drawing that, um, it, that Gustav made. And it's a, it's a Sankfoil ring and it's mixed metal. And um, I, think it's, uh, I think it might be chrysoprase, but I'm not sure about the gem, but um, it's just a very pretty ring and very typical of what women were, were wearing in that, in that early uh, Gilded Age. Where, where is that ring? Is that ring in the family? It's, it's in our family, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this ring also in our family. Um, uh, 
grapevines were all the rage in um, decorative arts and Gustav did a lot of rings for Tiffany and company uh, using that motif. And this is a, this is, was not Mark Tiffany, but it uh, matches the drawings that we have uh, of Gustav's rings very closely. So we're um, pretty certain that it's his. I should, I should mention that Gustav didn't sign his jewelry. The convention at that time was uh, the, um, the retailer's mark was usually put on the jewelry if there was any mark at, at all beyond, beyond the uh, uh, carat mark, 14 carat or 18 carat. So um, that makes, it makes it a little more difficult for us to, uh, you know, to determine whether something is, is his or not. And we're really looking at stuff uh, that, that matches as, as closely as, as uh, we can make it to the drawings that, that we have. So a lot of sort of the flora and fauna, you know, he was, did he do any gardening himself or? You know, I don't think he was a gardener. Um, I think he spent his, um, he spent a lot of time at the Bronx Zoo, um, basically doing studies, animal studies, because he wanted to, and his, his animal uh, jewelry is very, very, uh, uh, close, very realistic, say that. So um, just shifting here during part of my um, immersion in, in all things Gustav was going through these cost books and I became fascinated by, I, I, we all knew the, the well-known jewelers names, but there were a lot of names in the, in the book that, uh, I didn't recognize, uh, including quite a number of women. And I did a lot of research on these women and all of them were connected to jewelry and um, which was interesting because uh, it was very difficult for women to get employment as actual bench jewelers or doing, you know, actually creating jewelry. They, they were usually designers. Um, some of these women were sculptors some of them did have um, people working for them, but I was able to identify uh, all of them and um, follow their, I was interested in following their stories. So just quickly, um, this is uh, Sophie Bauckham, who was Gustav's business partner and the mother of my great grandmother, um, who uh, was a diamond dealer. She had also been born in Germany. This person, she's the one is, with the braid, right? She's the one with the, she's with the one with the uh, Germanic braid, I guess. And she's actually she's wearing um, a really interesting suite of uh, a, a kind of birds that are are aloft on um, what look to me like uh, uh, baroque pearls. And so she's got this jewelry that she's she's pulled her hair back so you can see her jewelry. Um, the woman with the uh, to the left or to the left of her is Eleanor Clapp, uh, who was born a Quaker, and uh, uh, she got interested in jewelry. She was very wealthy, and so she could hire people to help her with her jewelry. And um, she was a real um, uh, trailblazer in terms of exhibiting jewelry in um, places like the. Buffalo Exposition, Expo, uh, Exposition in 1901 and in um, France. And she um, has had a, a notebook of her drawings that um, showed a lot of her, her uh, work, which I uh, got access to. And um, her one of her pieces was in a show at the uh, 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 Driehaus Museum in Chicago. And that was very gratifying to connect her to that. Um, the woman in, in the center with the, is, is Edith uh, Dean. And she was a Vassar graduate who became a um, decorative uh, designer, interior designer. And she had, did a little jewelry on the side. Um, the person, the lady on the, the far right with the fan 
is Sally, ja Sally James Farnham, who was married to Tiffany's chief um, designer, Paulding Farnham. And she herself was an artist and a sculptor. And uh, some of her pieces can be seen around Central Park. Um, she did very monumental uh, statues and um, I think was a, was a good friend of, of Gustav's. And uh, Marie Alcuri uh, in the bottom is uh, an interesting character. She um, was born in Lebanon and her family came to the US and her father uh, owned a, a, a jewelry store in Atlantic City called Tiaziz, the little shop of Tiaziz. Um, but Marie was quite talented and she, she went to, um, she went to college in, in the States and then she became a jewelry, uh, uh, she had a jewelry boutique and um, used Gustav to help her make her pieces. So I just found um, those histories quite interesting and uh, I guess I'm a sucker for those, uh, um, you know, for those women designing women and love to see them get more credit. Um, also among them was a uh, woman called Isabel Coles, who only shows up once in Mons's book, but she was a uh, Tiffany employee after going to Cooper Union and working for Mrs. Clapp. So it's a very interconnected world. And the piece she bought from Gustav was a stick pin with a Baroque pearl on it. And um, depicting Shylock and um, theater was so was was very um, important in those times there wasn't TV there wasn't radio um, people went to the theater and they went to the opera and they liked to dress up and and have their jewelry uh, for that so I think that she may have bought that to wear to a there was a there was a, a production of uh, um, the Merchant of Venice around the time she bought it. So I, I, I like to think that that's what she wore to, to it. What she's wearing in the photograph, however, is uh, something that she made in the 40s. Her career spanned 1900 to 1946. And she was um, uh, one of the jewelers included in a, a show at the MoMA, which was kind of a a milestone show. Um, I don't think that museums, museums really didn't, um, they didn't exhibit jewelry unless it was ancient jewelry. They didn't in, ex exhibit uh, modern jewelry or contemporary jewelry as a, a rule. It wasn't considered, I don't know. Um, it, it just seemed, it was fashion, not art. But MoMA, um, was the exception and she was in that uh, show with Joseph Albers and Annie, uh, excuse me, Joseph, Annie Albers, uh, Annie, Annie Albers and, and uh, um, Calder. And, and, yes, and Cal right, Calder. These are two pieces um, that uh, someone who was uh, a, a descendant of a very good friend of Isabel's uh, sent me there, uh, one looks quite like a Calder piece, and the other is uh, a necklace of made up of um, safety pins, and uh, they're enameled, and it's a great collar. I love it, and and it was during wartime, and I think there was a a sort of a sense that people wanted to experiment with ordinary materials and see what they could do with them, and I thought I think it's spectacular. A little bit of a digression from from <laughs> Gustav, but so getting back to Gustav, um, Kyler and I continued our hunt, and I guess what what really drove us was trying to find matches for um, for the drawings that we knew were his, um, and we had seen this mermaid ring in an article in Magazine Antiques, uh, and it was in an article about F. Walter Lawrence. Um, and we had the matching drawing, design drawing. Um, so I was really thrilled when um, I started doing some searching and discovered that there was another mermaid ring uh, in London at uh, 
a gallery called Tatima. Um, and we reached out to them and they attributed the ring to Gustav um, as well as F. Walter Lawrence when they saw the, the design drawing, which was very gratifying for us. Um, but even more exciting was going to a jewelry uh, conference and seeing a friend who's a, um, a goldsmith, a well-known goldsmith. And uh, my sister and I were sitting in the audience and Tom came up to us and uh, sort of waved this little box at us. And when we opened it up, I almost fainted. I, I couldn't believe that I was seeing the ring itself. And it turned out that it had been purchased by uh, an American collector and uh, we met and um, she was just, you know, thrilled to, to meet someone who was a descendant of the, the maker. These are um, drawings from, a, also from the scrapbook and um, the top cat is um, actually the handle of a walking stick. And the other two, um, have a little, you know, they're, they're, they're stick pins. And I always think of Cartier when I look at the one on the right, but these were drawn, I think, I believe before the Cartier leopard mm -hmm. um, came along. And uh, these are some uh, panthers. The one on the right was um, given to my father as a, as a wedding gift or as a uh, engagement gift and uh, it has his initials on it. And the one on the left is- Sorry. It's okay, you, you can go back. It's just a, it's just a, a great ring. Um, it doesn't need a stone though. You can see that there, there was a setting there. So this was one of, this was one of Amon's sample rings. Um, his, his daughter, his younger daughter, Doris was his saleswoman when she was 17 or 18 and the idea would be um, you would have have a um, a piece like this, and then you could hold stones up to it for the customer to choose and say, "Well, you know, do you want a pearl here? Do you want a lapis? Do you want a a, a citrine?" So this is just a model. It it wasn't something that was for sale. Um, Having looked at so many of Monza's cats, um, I was sort of uh, caught uh, intrigued by this, this uh, ring on the right, uh, which showed up in a, an auction catalog at Skinner. And um, he had made a lot of these and it just seemed to me to have all the ear markings of a, of a Mons ring. Plus it had no stamp on it, no jeweler's stamp on it. It just had the 14K. So I reached out to them. I sort of was starting to feel like, mm, I, I, I could do this, <laughs> I can, can recognize this stuff. And they in fact attributed it to Gustav before the auction came, which was great. Um, and satisfying getting getting that word out. And this just I like this sketch because it's in the it's in the cost books at Winter Tour, and it was just a reminder to um, to his uh, uh, bench workers of what what ring they were working on. It's part part of that, but. It's just, it shows, I, I love the quickness of that sketch. And, and I think it shows his, his artistry. <laughs> so. Well, I, I just keep just thinking, that. I keep thinking of the little cub he brought home from the zoo. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the oh, that back. story. Yeah. Right. No, um, no, I'm just saying, so a lot of these sort of, right. quick, you know, sort of interesting that he was using live models for this. Yes, person. yes. Um, so this, um, this, piece also showed up on that um, winter tour uh, photograph. And it's a depiction of um, Aesop's fable of the lion and the snake. Um, there were actually more than one uh, Aesop fables of, uh, of encounters between snakes and lions, but um, it's, the, it's a funny looking stone because it's actually, um, uh, Cyprian glass 
this uh, so this is one of the the, the most exciting discoveries we um, you know we knew about the 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 one in the picture but this came up on an estate um, jewelry site and we reached out to the to the owner and invited him to come have tea and showed him our picture and we got to see this and hold this this uh, uh, quite large brooch for the first time and it's just the the, the workmanship is really really great and uh, and that was just another one of those making that connection and uh, as a result I think he started looking at other pieces to think you know see if they might be months um, this is a this is a collage that I put together um, uh, showing that Gustav uh, Bring, you know, not all the cost books that we have looked at are his. We, we were able to, to um, track down some of his clients. And there was one in particular named Ferdinand Holtz, who was in, in uh, Chicago. And Mons made a, a ton of stuff for him, many uh, uh, elephant cuff bracelets and brooches and all kinds of stuff. Um, so I just uh, put this together. This is a, a little excerpt from from uh, Ferdinand Hotz's uh, uh, cost books. The ring on the right, oh, I was just gonna say quickly, the ring on the right appeared in a story um, uh, about the uh, jewelry coming out of F. Walter Lawrence's studio. And I'm pretty certain that this one was inspired by Rosa Bonheur, the famous painting. Um, I love, the bear ring, and the, there are a couple of bear rings in our family. Um, I was saying to Karen earlier that um, mammals are really, really hard to make elegant on a tiny scale. And I think that that was one of Gustav's great um, skills that he could do that. And some more, uh, I think these are tigers. Um, these are uh, on the, on the, outer um, edges, those are the sketches uh, we found in, in um, our scrapbook. And we're pretty, pretty certain that this is uh, Gustav's work. This is one of his design cards, which you know would be a calling card to leave at different, uh, it's probably something that Doris, his daughter, who was the saleswoman would carry around just to update, um, potential, potential uh, uh, business. And uh, as again, you can see, he's doing a lot of miniature animals. I love, love, love the terrier on the lower left. And um, it, very, you know, they were very popular. They were very, them. very popular. And um, may, perhaps the favorite dog of US presidents. Um, I think Teddy Roosevelt had a terrier. I, I think, I think, was that Asta? I'm not quite sure. In FDR, any of them, there, I think that was FDR. Um, and the this that you can see that um, Black, we know Black Star and Frost was one of his primary uh, outlets, and they clearly loved his animal work too. And these are all Pave diamond pieces, the butterflies in the middle. Um, so they were a long time, long standing outlet. Um, what, what's here is a little bit of a collage. Um, the uh, pendant in the upper right was on the um, front page of Jewelers Circular um, in the issue um, about the Met, Met uh, Museum's industrial art exhibit in which um, Gustav participated in 1924, along with Cartier and um, some less well-known firms uh, from that era. And the purpose of the, the industrial art um, exhibition was to promote American, uh, the American uh, uh, products and, and also raise the standard of, of uh, design for those products. So the, that was part of the, rationale for having that um, 
and it and Oops, sorry it's okay no it's fine um these are some fox pins that uh he made that gives you a sense of um his uh his ability to set diamonds and i think they're cute <laughs> um this is collage it might be a little confusing but i'll start from the bottom the bottom is uh a uh I guess it's a kind of Renaissance uh, inspired uh, bracelet with these dragons and their um, uh, uh, fiery tongues. And the detail, the middle part is just a detail so you can see what, what they look like. This, uh, this was a um, bracelet that was retailed by T. Kirkpatrick and Sons. And they were also a, um, regular client of Gustav Mons and um, it's been attributed to Gustav Mons. Uh, I put in a, a sample of one of his uh, dragon rings. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but it you can see the, the spirit of it. These are, um, there were other photographs at, at Winter Tour, um, including a number of diamond pieces and the one on whoops on the right I just want to say the one on the right was uh actually I, f I found a, a kind of matching one out in the uh out in the uh, at a, a a store in San Francisco um so it was just again uh, being able to identify and and do do a match was exciting um these are uh, I guess the draw the drawings show you how um, Gustav would design diamond mounts, um, but the resulting mount look is a is a little more. Um, you see the gems, but these were just the shapes and and uh, styling of how they would be where where the diamonds would go. Uh, this this is another piece from Gustav's uh, archive, and it was also um, made for T. Kirkpatrick. So I probably should have put those two together. But. And it's a dress clip, it separates. So it can be worn as one clip or- On each lapel. On each, on each uh, yeah, lapel. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, um, Gustav really, really loved to, um, do flowers of all kinds, but the iris and um, and lilies were probably his favorite. And this iris brooch was exhibited at, at the Driehaus Museum a few years back and um, was uh, retailed by Marcus and Company. And Mar Gustav did do work for, for Marcus and um, it's been attributed to him. He did, it, it's in his style and these are also um, the two drawings on the left and right are from uh, our scrapbook, our mother's scrapbook. And Gustav had a number of categories, including uh, uh, Greek. And a lot of his um, rings reflect that interest and, and jewelry. This is Isadora Duncan. and. Uh, and a figure of Aurora, and we were just amused by the, um, you know, that the possibility that he was inspired by these uh, these dancers to do his own his own version. Um, this is a uh, an ex exhibition that um, this was actually the first exhibition I I found that that he participated in, and it was at. The Providence Art Club, which um, uh, had the archives and the listings, and uh, F. Walter Lawrence once again paired, teamed up with uh, with Gustav, whose name is unfortunately misspelled. Um, but uh, some of these pieces are things that we're on the lookout for. Uh, here again is um, you know some of the. Uh, I guess the these the, the magazines featuring jewelry um, included the Keystone and jewelry, uh, the Jeweler Circular, and also 
The Craftsman, which um, was Gustav Stickley's uh, magazine. And so uh, this piece the, uh, with the three graces appeared in an article by F. Walter Lawrence, who was uh, writing about the, the trend in, in trends in, in arts and crafts jewelry. Uh, I love this picture. Uh, it's a brochure from um, a, uh, that that was kind of released. I think it was released right at the height of the the Tut um, fanatical uh, interest, and the the you can see some more of these uh, Egyptian designs. The one on the right was in um, a, a London uh, newspaper, and it shows. Cartier's recent line at that time, I think it's 19, oh, um, 1924. And I decided I would try to replicate it with pictures from um, Mons's cost book. Pretty close, I think. Very close. Very close. Um, and this is a, um, again, this kind of illustrates what jewelers would do. Um, you could put a stone on a on a on a uh, drawing and see if you liked it and see if it was what you wanted or try another. So he had uh, had many of these bracelet designs that that showed variations on a theme. Uh, this is a pendant that uh, is just be, that that we think is is Gustav's and. Um, it's next to some other Egyptian uh, pieces that were illustrated in his books. He really liked those uh, pharaohs. This is a desk set of, um, and it's, it's, I think, copper. I'm not sure. But anyway, it, it's a, an inkwell and a stamp box and a place for people to put their nibs and it's in our family. This is a fun piece. I didn't understand what it was when I first saw it. The, 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 the plaque on the right, it belongs to a cousin of ours. And I thought, that's, a, that's what a strange thing he did. I couldn't, couldn't figure it out. And then I read about rebuses and um, and uh, the more I looked at, at beetle um, a scarab jewelry, I realized that there was a trend in having them roll over. And so what Gustav had done was um, make a plaque that's the eye of Horus, I, love, and then a U. And that's what I guess um, would, you know, you could flip it around and amuse your friends. Um, he made this for a, a, a company called A.A. Vantine, which was sort of a, um, a, a bazaar, a kind of a, 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 a store that, that carried you know, wicker furniture and uh, towels and sandals and so forth. And they had uh, a jewelry section and Gustav, it was a more of a mid-level kind of a uh, kind of jewelry store um, and he did a lot of work for them. Um, wow. All of his work was passed off as Chinese or Asian. There was Asian import also, but um, it wasn't all it wasn't always what you thought it was. Well, I think the other interesting thing about Vantines is it was in the original ABC carpet, that whole, that was that's right. Vantines that's right. back in the early yep. part of the century. Yes. So. so so they show up quite a lot. Um, so here we are back at, um, you know, searching for some of these early pieces. And um, I'm trying to think. Uh, well, you told me about um, something, you know, this desert brooch made out of Cyprian glass. Mm -hmm. um, F. Walter Lawrence, this was exhibited. Mm -hmm. And somehow I think you got a phone call or- Oh yeah, this is the phone call. Um, uh, 
few weeks before we all went into quarantine for COVID in early in 2020, um, my, I got a, an email from a, an estate jeweler uh, on my Gustav Mons account saying, we have the desert brooch and the desert brooch had been labeled the desert brooch in various um, advertisements or places. And I couldn't believe it. <laughs> it was so shocking to me that she had tracked me down. And it turned out that she had read my blog and she had seen the picture. They had been looking for the maker for a year they were just trying to search and figure out who the heck made this thing. And then they saw the, the blog post. Um, it's a huge uh, brooch with Cyprian glass and a gold, gold, this, uh, gold carving around the edge. And um, I, think, I think you'll see a picture on the next, the next slide. That's what it looks like. And um, my sister and I hopped on a, a, the car, I hopped into the car and drove straight to Philadelphia so we could see it and photograph it. And it was kind of a, an amazing story um, they shared with us. Uh, I, I asked him where, you know, how on earth did you find this? It was, you know, did, did somebody die and just, you know, the heirs sold it off. He said, well, actually it had been at a safe deposit auction, something I'd never heard of, <laughs> a safe deposit auction auction in Ohio. And that's all he told me about it. So of course, at this point, I'm very used to sort of going online and say, I'm going to, I'm going to find out, I see if I can find it. And I did. It was in, I think it was in, I, I can't, it may have been in Akron, Ohio. And I got the auction catalog and went to, through it, and there it was. And it had been in a, a, a collection that included pieces by Bovin. So it was obviously um, you know, held by somebody who liked good jewelry. Um, it's a kind of a difficult piece to wear. It's quite heavy. And I think it probably mostly um, sat in a cabinet for people as a curiosity which was something that, that people like to do back then. So Laura, this is, we've gotten to the case of the missing pendant. Ah, oh, yes. So what So um, going back to the three graces brooch, I was on my Instagram and um, going through it the way we do and suddenly, someone posted from the Baltimore uh, antique show. Cra is it the craft show or the antique show? Antique show. Oh, the antique show. Um, and in her hand was this Three Graces brooch, which I had never seen in color. I had no idea what it really looked like. And she posted a picture. It She didn't identify it. I don't think she knew what it was, but she, she had posted the photograph. So I quickly um, sent a direct message to her and said, hey, um, do you, did you end up buying that? I might be interested. She said, oh, I, you know, I, I looked at it, but, and I was in, tempted, but she, she didn't. And I said, do you remember by any chance who the, who the uh, uh, dealer. dealer was? And she said, oh, I, I think Chicago. So I spent a couple of hours Googling and, and got the uh, catalog and went through every uh, dealer's page and narrowed it down to the three who were from Chicago and called them. And sure enough, they had it and we acquired it. I just couldn't let that one slip away. Um, it was part of, uh, an exhibit, it, it hadn't gone to St. Louis, it had gone to C Cincinnati. And um, we, you know, we treasure it. It went to the Cincinnati Craft Show. Here it is in living color. So that so, was just sheer luck, or maybe just being, you know, always keeping an eye out. Well, I think, you know, it's fascinating how sometimes these pieces just come to you. 
you know, with all the work you've done and mm -hmm. sort of, and and this is a pendant and a brooch. It right? is a pendant like and a brooch. Wear it both ways. Yes. It just, just, yeah. The desert brooch, it can't work as a pendant. It's way too heavy, but this one is a, has a, just a little clasp on the back. And that's so common for that era. I mean, that, uh, you know, people who wore jewelry like to have that versatility. Well, thank so. you, Laura, terrific talk. <laughs> and we have time for a few questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell, you know, give you a few. Um, Judy <laughs> Barr said, uh, his pieces are sculptural. Do you know if he carved directly into the gold or was it carved in wax and then cast? I think he did a lot of wax carving. That's my my impression. We do have some of his waxes um, that, uh, you know, for some of his uh, animal figures. So I think he did it. But to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure I could I could tell the difference. You know, I don't I don't really know uh, how to look at a piece of jewelry and say, oh, that's a that's a lost wax method or this is, you know, carved. He was a sculptor. He did very, you know, some some fairly large sculptors uh, with animals. And I there again, I don't know if wax is involved. Sorry. So Okay, so one another question: How did he get started in jewelry? I mean, what did he? It's it's really interesting because I only in the past year discovered that his uncle. I I often wondered what you know here he he grew up in a family of um, people of Catholic laymen who worked um, for for the church in Southwest uh, Germany. And I just could, didn't have any any documentation for where he had gone to school. How all we knew was that he had apprenticed and um, you know traveled quite a lot, and that was his apprenticeship. But I discovered in the last year that his uncle um, was a very prominent Fortsheim um, uh, manufacturing jeweler, um, and it came it came by way of uh, my uh, ancestry.com hmm. digging. And when I realized that Mons's mother's sister was married to this guy, some things fell into place that I, you know, there were entries in his uh, cost books for uh, a guy named Max Whittem. And it turned out that Max Whittem was actually Gustav's cousin. So it made sense that he was there. Um, uh, and anyway, it, you know, it, it, it's just nice to to uh, get those nail those facts down if you can. It's it's so rare that you can discover that. So, um, well, um, so what? So big question: Are you planning on publishing something? And do you have? Here's another. You know, scan drawings. Um, available to view because I think there are a lot of people out there who would like to find pieces or even know if they're in their own kind of collections? Oh, huh. well, we'll <laughs> get, maybe send me a private message and we can discuss that. <laughs> the publishing world is very secretive about that kind of thing. I, I, you know, I, I do love writing about it and I find the, um, the spontaneous writing of a, a caption on, uh, on Instagram or, a quick blog completely, um, you know, I, I don't have the writer's block that I think I would have if I were having to write a thesis. I, I can do it quick and, and uh, it's very satisfying to get it down that way. Well, one of the, uh, so someone asked, how are you keeping track of the pieces that you're still looking for and haven't found yet. How do you how do you keep track of that? They're not uh, in or that or that or whether you found them or they're not in your possession. So, example, the desert brooch. I know the auction house still has it and it's for sale. Right. For right. want to sort of give the price right now in case there's anyone interested <laughs> uh, I think the price is 39,000 something like that in that in that area um, honestly to me you know I 
uh, we have some wonderful mom's pieces and if and have acquired I'm actually wearing a, a, a ring that we uh, purchased at auction that uh, I don't think anyone will be able to see it, but it's a fish ring and uh, it has very fine detail on it and uh, we were able to acquire it for auction. I'd say that my sister and I are always looking, you know, we're always on the lookout for possible Mon stuff that we could acquire and bid on. Um, but uh, I don't have to own it to be happy to have seen it, you know, is, is often just that's, it's very nice to know it exists. Right, and you, you get the story even if you and don't. And to get the story. The and, so and here's figure out the people who own, you know, who bought it. Um, so I have a comment from mm -hmm. Donna O'Haran. Um, hi, Donna. <laughs> hi. Okay, Laura, thank you so much for this fascinating presentation. It's wonderful to learn more about my very talented, great, great uncle Gustav and his <laughs> reverse jewelry. So thank you, um, Donna. <laughs> on that note, because I think I'm going to give everyone um a way to get in touch with you so you have your website which is incredible you also have your blog on it so i i think there's a lot of drawings i mean you you posted a lot of content we on do it. we do so, so that's available and you also you and your sister have also started reissuing a few designs of monza's i think that's also on your website it is made it by is. master goldsmith in new york I think. we have a wonderful goldsmith in new york and so um, that you can view yes. those pieces on gustavmons.com and then follow Laura on Instagram or Facebook. Yes. Um, and of course, DM her if you have a piece right now, <laughs> right now, live, you know, would love to see that. Anyway, um, I one of the other things I want to mention, the jewelry library has a uh, which we posted on our website. Um, a jewelry tour, sort of a Gilded Age jewelry tour of Nomad, which is the area we're in. And Mons's studio is on that tour and you can find it on our website. And if you're in New York or you're visiting the spring and you just wanna take a walk around, Anna Rash, the his jewelry historian Anna Rash um, put together this sort of walking tour and you can do it yourself. And it's really fascinating just the way all those jewelers kind of converged. They were in the same neighborhood and that's retailers and makers. So it's kind of, you know, it's really interesting that this is like a little microcosm of what was happening in jewelry at that time, you know, in the early part of the century. So Laura, unless there's any more questions and we're gonna just do a final check because this was so fantastic and so inspiring. I think I learned so much about research from Laura. Um, <laughs> Okay, this is a very, is there a mystery still there, like something right on your like docket that you're trying to solve right now? Um, I, I plead the fifth. I don't think, <laughs> I don't have one right in front of me, but, uh, but I'll let you know. Well, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's a good idea to post on your Instagram something, you know, mm -hmm. something that you're looking for because I, th you know, that people might go out and do some, their own searching. There's certainly, you know, certainly other pieces in those ex exhibitions that um, I have my eye on finding. Well, I'll let you know. Okay, well, I'll I'm sure. I think hopefully there'll be a part two of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So much fun. It was, it was Thanks, fun. everyone. Thanks to everyone for coming. Um, really exciting to, you know, hear this talk and. Um, I hope you'll sort of stay tuned for future programming. Laura, thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, good night, everyone.